Good morning, North MacArthur. Uh, my name is Evan Todacitni. Uh, myself, my wife, and our three daughters do mission work in Arizona on several Native American reservations. Um, I've been asked this morning to lead us in a scripture reading. So if you would, please uh, get your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 5. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12, and also be reading out of the New, Mer New American Standard uh, Version. So if you have that, um, would you follow along with me? Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger, and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, verse 12, and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank you. Well, I feel like I need to start warning you uh, that apparently there is a bird in the auditorium. I know that by saying that, I immediately have made all of you start looking. Uh, so focus, focus. There's been a few solutions proposed uh, for this uh, problem. Gus Wilson told me, he said, Mel, that's not a problem at all. You're such a young, good-looking man that people's gaze will just be at you and nothing will distract him. I was like, oh, Gus, that's sweet, thank you. Uh, but now I'm actually a little anxious about that because if you look away, it's going to hurt my self-esteem and I'm going to cry later. So just, just, just so you know. I had a solution. Uh, a few years back, David Tully took me duck hunting. For the very first time, I missed everything I shot at. Uh, I think I scared David in the process as well. I literally think I heard the ducks laughing as they flew around us, but David hit everything he shot at, so I thought we could get David to have his shotgun and just hide behind the bush here. Uh, I'm sure he would take care of it at the right time. A couple of the elders thought that was not visitor friendly, so we will not be trying that this morning, so be at peace with it. There's a theological possibility that this is a dove, and right at the height of my sermon, the dove will fly down, land on my shoulder, and you will hear a voice saying, this is my preacher of whom I'm well pleased. So we don't, we'll just wait to see what comes out of it. Uh, you know, so this should be fun. All right. Last time, uh, we, last Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then today, uh, kind of our mission Sunday, we, we've been all, and tonight my dad will present uh, about the work in Brazil that we're involved with. It's, it's about our Mission Sunday, right? Um, we talked about last time how Jesus is in, the, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. He's introduced as Emmanuel, which is significant because that means God with us. And it was the presence of God in the Old Testament that freed Israel from Egypt and slavery and death and began this process of molding them into a set-apart holy nation. To be a beacon, a light unto the nations of what it looked like to have the presence of God. And then with that, we, uh, Jesus begins in Matthew kind of his ministry, his, his uh, public ministry, his run for presidency in a sense. That was how most of the people that came to Jesus thought that he was trying to be king, had some politics behind it and so forth. And just like any good politician, uh, if you're going to run for presidency, you have to have a one-liner. One-liner, right? 
And not to promote one or the under or other here, but I'll just give you a couple examples. Obama, when he ran, remember? Hope and change. Hope and change. Uh, President uh, Trump, let's make America great again. So very one-liners that they believe uh, symbolize or, or encompasses and kind of puts all together the idea of what they're for. Jesus, Matthew 4, verse 17, it says, from that time forward, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's his one-liner. Repent, it literally means turn around from the direction you're going, come back, come back, because the reign of God is here. The kingdom of God is kind of this imagery of kingdoms marching against each other. The kingdom of God is march. It's here. It's at the door. It's at the door. So this morning, the sermon is entitled, Funding a Revolution. Now, that might get different responses from you. Uh, maybe you're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of witty, you know. See where he's going to go with that. Uh, some of you might think, mm, politics, politicians, you know, we're in the president's presidency cycle. We kind of get some negative feelings there. Some of you are completely, you just think, every time we talk about kingdoms or country, we think of wars and, and, and imposition and uh, battles and, you know, armies. And, well, those are all fair. Because the language Jesus is using is, is that's what people would, would, would feel. Israel had been ruled over for 600 years. Can you imagine? 600 years. There was great tension. I mean, war is brewing. It won't be but 40 years from Jesus' uh, death, bare resurrection, that things will spark to a degree. Rome will come besieged Jerusalem for a year, destroyed the temple. To this day, 2,000 years later, it's not rebuilt. I mean, it was some tense, tense time. So when Jesus starts talking about kingdom, the reign of God is here, folks would have had all kinds of feelings, intense feelings, intense feelings, politics, war, armies, revolutions. Now, you know, like mentioned already, we got, we're in the season of politics and whatever feelings you have about that. Uh, people are asking for your vote and for your money and for your support. Because, and if you come get behind a candidate or a party or a one-liner or something other, is you believing that that person, that vision, is what, what we need. Right? Same here. You understand what you just did this morning and what we do every morning, not just money, or every Sunday morning, not just money, but your, your presence, your funding, believing, accepting something, someone. Actual revolution. But even though Jesus uses language that's very intense, in a time of great tension, it's not through violence. It's not through power, power plays. It's not through demeaning others. It's not through criticisms. It's not through aggression, physical or verbal, which often reflects our politics. That's not it. It's this weird approach to a very upside down, strange kingdom. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Matthew 5, 1 through uh, 12 is, is this upside down kingdom, right? So, chapter 4, the end of chapter 4. Who's the crowds? Who is he speaking to? Think about this. If you're going to launch your presidency, yeah, you're going to launch your candidate, you're going to be a candidate to run for president. You're going to launch it. You want to make that memorable, right? You want to rehearse your speech. What you say then kind of sets the stage for where you're going, for what you're trying to do, for what you believe in. So at the end of chapter 4, we get a list of the crowds, of who was there, and it's the, it's the broken. 
It's the, the sick. It's the hurting. It's the poor. It's the, the, those that are physically lame. It's the nobodies of society. Those that had absolutely no political power, no voice, no power at all to make any changes. Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem, which would be a great place to jumpstart your, your career there. Kind of, you know, go to the temple, people are there, and you give this patriotic, nationalistic, powerful, let's make Israel great again, and folks would have been on board. Jesus goes out to Podunk nowhere, sits on a hill, and talks to the nobodies. And to them, he gives this brilliant Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the good news of the kingdom is first offered to the nobodies of that world. I want you to grasp that. The nobodies. I don't think this is accidental. It's a weird kingdom with upside-down approach offered to the nobodies. Think about that. So... He starts out with, you know, these blessings, beatitudes, which you and I probably, eh, I don't know what that even means. What's a beatitude? Blessings, we're a little more on board. Some translations try to break through all that and say happy. Uh, actually, this was a common approach. A hundred-ish, 20 years or so before Jesus, we get a list of blessings of another Jesus, by another Jesus, Jesus ben Sira. He was a a very well-known, still is, very well-known uh, uh, rabbi in the Jewish community. Jesus and the people of his time would have been well acquainted with him. His stuff would have been circulating. Still Jews today go to him. He wrote a lot of stuff, said a lot of things. A very prominent rabbi who's going to give a list of what it looks like to have the presence of God. When, let me say it differently. When, when you hear me say the American dream, you, you, you understand, right? It's a concept. Now, we might disagree on how to articulate it, but in a sense, we get it. It's just like if, if you're an American and you, you're here, there's this dream, this, these possibilities. This, it's for you, and, and it's good, and it calls people to want to be here. And most of our politicians are trying to articulate some version of what they think that believe, they believe that to be. Jesus starts out with a common approach. What does the blessed life look like? And so he's going to give nine points to it. Uh, two at the bottom there I'm going to kind of put together. But listen to Jesus ben Sira, a hundred plus years before Jesus. Okay, before Jesus. So he says, I can think of nine whom I would call blessed, and the tenth my tongue proclaims. So number one, let's walk through this. A man who can rejoice in his children. That makes sense. I think if you're a parent, you understand that. Your children is not just, you know, offsprings. It's, it's, it's part of who you are, and it's a legacy, and it's a blessing of God, and there's so many wonderful things there uh, that, you, you know, you hope your children rise to that, and you train them well, and so forth. So, okay, number two, a man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. Not sure Jesus the Christ of Nazareth would say it this way. Actually, he says, love your enemies. So a little difference there. But in a very prominent rabbi, Jesus ben Sira, the fall of your enemies is the presence of God with you. Oh, there's some examples in the Old Testament. God was David's, his enemies fell, so forth. Number three, happy the man who lives with a sensible wife. Well, I... I can attest because I have a very loving, sensible, wonderful wife. Uh, that is true, right? The marriage, and there's a lot of blessings there for sure. Number three, number four, and the one who does not plow with an ox and donkey together. Okay, so number five, uh, <laughs> I'll let you decide what that means. Happy is the one who does not sin with his tongue. Well, there's a lot of, about that in James and other places. Number six, uh, and the one who has not served an inferior. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, some of you might feel that way. Your manager is an idiot. And you were thinking, I'm not sure I can say that here. I'm sorry. So uh, I'll be coming forward here. 
Your, your manager is not the person that you think should lead and manage because you are more qualified. You ever feel that? No, seriously. This, 2,000 years ago, same feeling. If God is with you, you will never serve an inferior. You'll never serve an inferior. Well, that's definitely a different worldview than Jesus Christ is going to talk about. Number seven, happy is the one who finds a friend. Well, that's good. We all want friends. You know, our kids go to school, and that's probably mostly what's on their mind, finding a friend who they're going to eat lunch with and so forth. Number eight, uh, and the one who speaks to attentive listeners. Now, I would like to spend a good amount of time talking about that one. <laughs> yeah, when you speak, you feel like you got something important to say, and people don't listen. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever taught anything or spoke to your children, you, you can relate to this, right? Number nine, uh, how great is the one who finds wisdom, but none is superior to the one who, has, who fears the Lord. Fear of the Lord surpasses everything. To whom can we compare the one who has it? Right, so this would have been discussed and this particular list approach would have been used even up to the time of Jesus. What does it look like to have the Israelite dream to be God's people? This is where, why Jesus begins his speech with blessed are those and that he's going to give his list. Nine as a matter of fact. So let's walk through it, all right? Uh, let's go here. Matthew 5. Chapter uh, 5, verse 3. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, there's a, a very important blessing there, of course, the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is near. Whatever that means, the reign of God is here, and there is a way you, the nobodies of society who've been oppressed as a nation for 600 years, can be a part of. And it has something to do with poor in spirit. Now, he's speaking to people who are physically poor. I don't know how many poor people say, I feel blessed because I'm poor. Now, they can feel blessed by a lot of other reasons, but poverty, poverty is something blessed. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. Because of your current situation, your societal, your kind of where you fit, the pecking order, the fact that you are poor, that you have government, there was no kind of uh, food stamps, there was no government help, nothing. These people were completely left to, to the generosity of maybe some family members because society did not take care of them. You are blessed. You know why? Because you know that when your politicians get up and tell you all these promised wonderful things they're going to they're gonna do, and when they get up and they describe the state of the union and it's a beautiful, wonderful, and everything's great, you know that's not true. You know. You're living it. You know it's fluff. You know it's wishful thinking at best. Lies at worst. You are not detracted, distracted, or uh, you have no illusions that the kingdoms that, are, that you're currently a part of are the solution. Blessed are you because you have that real realization, also spiritually speaking, thus you are open to the doings of God's reign. Does that make sense? Most of us have our heads in the sand. And we think our politicians are the solution. We think our government is the solution. We think that any other group of folks out there somewhere are the solution. They're not. Can they better some stuff? Yeah, why not? The reign of God is the only solution. The only kingdom. But if you're not intuitive of that, you will not be open for it, to it. But those folks were because they had no illusions. No illusions. Number two, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I, I, I don't know. Does anybody here just enjoy, maybe enjoy a kind of a good cry, just to kind of, you know, get your feelings out there? Uh, I think, you know, Barry Clark, I think he, he enjoys a good cry. He was telling me that the other day. The, no, I mean, 
Uh, you go to a funeral, uh, are you feeling blessed? You're mourning, come on, is that? Feel the presence of God because you're, normally we mourn out of some sense of pain. Right? But what's the blessing? There's going to be some comfort. So something about the reign of God is here. We're under no illusions that the governments and whatever other promises and politicians and leaders and whatever, we're under no illusion, or these people were under no illusion. They're the solution. These folks did not have their heads in the sand because they really could not. You, how can you not know the world's horrible? How can you not know the world is full of broken relationships? How can you not know that the world is full of physical health problems if you're these folks you do know you do know the world's rough painful broken blessed are you that have a clear understanding of that truth you know why because you're looking for a solution you are open for comfort when you're at a funeral, do you just feel so overwhelmed and so broken and so lost and so anxious that you're just there, not even feeling, I mean, you just, your world's collapsing. You are ready for comfort, right? Do you, are you not clear that you at least need comfort? We need to have that sense of the world being broken. We cannot distract ourselves. We cannot pretend, because most of us are financially well off enough, that the world is, yeah, okay, and you know, and it's fine, and you would just kind of wait, and eventually heaven shows up, and it's, it's all good. Until then, wonderful. And we distract ourselves, we warm the pews, and we just kind of put our heads in the sand, and then let's just move along. The world is broken. People are hurting. It is completely overwhelmed and run by darkness. Only when you have that clear realization are you open to the doings of God in your life. How blessed it is to those who mourn because of a broken world. Number three, blessed are the meek. When was the last time you said meek? Right? What, what does that even mean? Now, I think these are all just flowing one from the other. Meek, what, what does that mean? Blessed are the meek. I think it means because you know the world's so broken, because you know the world is falling apart, because you're under no illusions of all these other promises made out there, you understand how broken the world is. You are submissive. You are meek. It's like a, 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 a horse who submits to his rider. It doesn't submit to his rider, and you're holding two little straps there because somehow the horse is overwhelmed by your, you know, your mighty presence. The horse submits to you. You and I need to be, because we understand how broken the world is and how the solutions offered out there are just, just fluff, we are ready for the, to be submissive to the reign of God. We are meek, humble, gentle. We put ourselves under the, the solution from God. These folks were ready for what Jesus was offering. Uh, number four, where are we at? four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Righteousness doesn't only mean doing right things. The way the Bible uses it is being in a right relationship. Thus, I behave a certain way. If you are in a right relationship with your spouse, you do things for your spouse not out of a sense of checklist duty, but out of a loving relationship. You with me? So the good things you do is because you are in a right relationship. And if you understand the world is broken, it is falling apart, and relationships are strained. Come on, do we not live in divided times? Over every topic, I mean, you can pick the topic. Social issues, race, all in politics. You are so ready for that to be mended. Mended. And you thirst 
and hunger, which are not pleasant things, you are desperately thinking of nothing else but let's fix our broken relationships. God will make that happen because that's what God came to do. Jesus came to, break, to fix the broken relationships between God and us, us and us. That's why Jesus says love God and love one another. Everything else leads to that. So you long for relationships to be done right because you know they're not. Thus you're ready for the presence of God in making that happen. Number five, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. You cannot have mended relationships. You cannot have reconciliation, what's kind of a buzzword today, without mercy. Without you being kind to those that do not deserve it. Without you loving those that have not earned it. Without you being compassionate to those that are suffering. That's how relation. This is this kingdom. How are we going to take over the world? Mercy. Mourning. Meekness. Poverty of spirit. What a revolution, huh? Number six. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God is about light. That's what we were talking about last Sunday. God's about light, so that's, we got to be light. We cannot be darkness and claim to be light. I mean, John says that in his first letter. If you claim to have the presence of God, yet you hate your neighbor, you are a liar. Pure in heart isn't just pure thoughts. It's trying to let God's presence make us pure, push hell out of us. Number seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In a world where they had been ruled over for 600 years, the Israelites were bubbling at the seams with rage, oppressed. Some of them were being bought out, I mean, pushed out of their ancestral homelands that had been theirs for a thousand plus years because of taxes. Some of them were having their kneecaps broken in a sense because they wouldn't pay taxes. In prison, beaten, oppressed, with no recourse. Can you see why war is brewing? And what does Jesus come and say? This kingdom, the presence of God, is about peace. Talk about, talk about some out-of-the-box, I mean, you can see, wild, upside-down, counterintuitive. You want to you do reconciliation in this broken world? Be about, be about peace. You want to bring po political groups together? Be about peace. Because that's what God is. Number eight, blessed are those who are persecuted. Now, why would we be persecuted? It's like if I told every single one of you today to leave here after our wonderful lunch, I hope you stay, uh, and you leave here and every single one of you go home driving on the left side of the road. Would that cause some troubles? It, of course it would. It's counterintuitive. This is a kingdom that is completely opposite to what the world is doing. You will find tension, conflict, persecution when you do this. But Jesus calls it a blessed because your, the kingdom is yours. He, he starts with that and ends with that. This kind of person, this kind of recognition that these blessings reflect, the kingdom is yours because that's the kingdom that is here to reign. And then number nine, and you could put these two together, he goes on to talk about you will fight this. It will be a tense world now. But others that proclaim the word of God had to face this mess. But eventually, on the other side of eternity, this is all yours. This world that God here is promoting. So when we talk about funding a revolution, this is the revolution. Does it sound like oppressive Approach, violence, hatred, power plays, military might. No. I hope you can get behind this revolution. 
A world needs it. A world needs it. And to conclude with the same point we introduced last Sunday, chapter 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and being praised to God because all that Jesus is saying here is because he claims to be God that came to be with us. If we claim to have the presence of God, we are going to be living this kingdom. We're going to be promoting this kingdom. We are going to be through that showing the world what it looks like to have the presence of God. Very different than all of these worldviews, all of these great dreams and all of these politics and all of these nations propose. That's what we're funding. That's what you've been funding. And that's what we're promoting here. Why don't you come as we stand and sing?